I'm Greg Johnson. This is CounterCurrents Radio. I'm joined today by Matt Parrott and Professor Kevin McDonald. Welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Hi, guys. How are you doing tonight? Great, great. Thanks for coming on. So I really enjoyed the piece that you wrote for the Occidental Observer on disenfranchised white males and the prospects for secession. And it looks like it just got mentioned in an article at Foreign Policy. Can we get your thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, it was a rather hysterical article, I thought, on foreign policy. I was a little surprised to see it, but they were trying to lump me in with a lot of other people, you know, neo-Nazis and so on. Uh, but the reality is that we, you know, we, we, we white people should be very, very concerned about this. And, of course, that's exactly what uh, the, the sort of mainstream thinking and people at foreign policy, this guy Berger, who I never heard of before, are trying to do. They they want to just squelch uh, any thought here that the uh, this, this election means anything in terms of racial politics. Uh, but it does. I mean, uh, this this is I mean, I, it's been going on for a while. I, mean, I, I started writing about this in 2008, but. It seems to me that it, it's more apparent than ever that uh, you're, you're having uh, these very, uh, very racialized voting blocks now. Whites uh, are declining percentage of the electorate, and ultimately we're going to lose political power. Uh, uh, so I, 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 when I talked about secession, I was sort of just trying to say something radical to wake people up. You know, I don't necessarily think that's the best way to go about things, but I'm trying to you know just sort of scream at the top of my lungs that. That uh, we have to start a really start uh, thinking seriously about uh, what our options are at this point. You know, uh, it's very depressing, and the, the fact that this guy Berger actually called for me getting fired uh, at long last, I think, as he put it, uh, at, uh, from my position at California State University, <laughs> I thought that was way over the top. Uh, that I. I I hadn't thought uh, about. Nobody from the university is contacting me about this. But anyway, that's what, those are my basic thoughts. So this is your Howard Beale, I'm as mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore moment. That's so. right. I mean, it's exactly right. I'm just furious about it. And, you know, we have to start talking about it. I was watching Bill O'Reilly just a minute ago, uh, and he predicted that there'd be huge percentage of blacks voting for Obama and huge percentage of Latinos and so on. And, and he was he got called out in the media for this because people were interpreting him as as being upset about it that he it was that the, that that he was concerned about this or something and didn't like the fact that all these uh, these non whites were voting uh, for Obama and o- o- O'Reilly's response is hey I don't care this is just fine you know uh, I I was just pointing up a fact you know he, in other words the whole idea that she would be upset about this. Uh, is so beyond the pale that even someone like O'Reilly can't just uh, acknowledge that, yeah, he, he should be upset about it. God. I personally have been very interested in this for a long time. When I was editing TOQ, I put out a, or put together a special issue on secession because I thought white nationalists really do need to start thinking seriously about the ins and outs of secession historically, politically, sociologically, philosophically, whatever. Matt, you've had a lot of uh, experience with Who's Your Nation and a particular kind of Midwest uh, identity politics. What do you think the prospects for secession are in America? Right now, I, I think our target audience is still very much asleep. I, the the writing's on the wall, the, the data is there, and this election has, has made it more difficult to ignore this uh, phenomenon of our replacement because it's it's starting to affect middle american uh white people they're starting to realize you know they've there have been these articles since since the 90s I, you know bill clinton was carrying on about it about oh you know we're going to be replaced in the next few decades ain't it wonderful and now it's sort of a oh my gosh we're being right. replaced <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's the actualization of the theory is a little a little more uh, uh discomforting than, than than merely discussing it uh in the abstract uh, having you know losing your voice, losing your power, and losing your neighborhood uh, is a visceral, terrifying experience. Uh, far removed from sitting there reading the newspaper and uh, reading these statistics and thinking about this as some sort of vague future thing that will be sorted out. And yeah, I, I think more and more people will be receptive to our message as as the consequences of this uh, god awful uh, social experiment unravel. 
One thing that I always recommend to people who live in middle America, people who live in predominantly white states and who are sort of complacent about these demographic trends is I recommend that they get in the time machine and visit the future. And by that, I simply mean that they get in an airplane and fly to California <laughs> and see the future of America, which has already arrived in California. Kevin, you were citing some pretty amazing statistics about California having, what, 12% of the population and 33% of the country's welfare recipients. Well, the amazing thing, we, we've added, like, I forget the exact numbers, but like 10 million people since uh, since between 1990 and 2005 or something like that to California. Of that number, 150,000 are paying taxes, and like 7 million are on Medicaid. I mean, in other words, we're just importing this mass of poor and educated people. And I, you know, I really do think a lot of my attitudes come from the fact that I, by fate, you know, got a job in California. That's where I live. I've seen it happen. When I came out here in 1985, you know, uh, the, my university was basically white. Uh, Orange County, where I live, was white. Uh, it, it was Republican and all that. All that's gone. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm concerned. I mean, I, I, I think it, it really uh, raised all, of, all the red flags for me. Whereas, you know, you, like you say, if you live out in some place uh, in, you know, Minnesota, small town, and you're still all white and still wonderful and all that, but you don't think about it. And, you know, you don't, it's not your problem, really. And, but, yeah, it's, it's staring me in the face every day. Yeah, we've, we've both got front row seats on, on our exactly. demographic eclipse here it's already happened i think the point one of the points you made in in your piece is that now that the democrats have a supermajority in the california legislature the ability of republicans to stop tax increases is over and this is really i think going to be the death knell for the white middle class in the state of california i think the demographic profile of california is rapidly going to become well, it's going to it's going to look like a country like Mexico, where you've got a very small white upper class and a vast number of poor non-whites, and very few middle class people and very few white middle class people. That's right. I mean, they're, 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 in fact, uh, in fact, white people have been moving out of the state for some time, you know. And uh, I, you know, frankly, I, I'm thinking very strongly of doing that. My my position that. Cal, Cal State ends in two years, and uh, after this, I, I think I might just leave because, uh, yeah, I think that they are going to start raising taxes with impunity. I mean, ever since I, you know, from the 1990s, the Republicans have been holding it back. You know, I mean, they and you know, eventually it got to the point that every last Republican had to oppose the tax increases, and of course now. Uh, they have a supermajority. They can, you know, they can even override the governor. Governor Brown is a fairly moderate guy in some ways, but they can override him if they want. There's no, there's nothing standing between them and taxing everybody. They get rid of Proposition 13, which protects homeowners from, from rapid rises in their real estate taxes. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to happen. I, I don't see uh, anything to stop it. One of the things that's so extraordinary about the Bay Area is Property prices are so high here, and they really started ballooning in the 90s with the whole tech bubble. Property prices are so high that there are, in, there are entire cities where the vast majority of the people who live there now could not afford to buy their house if they bought it at market prices. And, of course, they're paying property taxes indexed back to the time when they bought the place. And if Proposition 13 is uh, swept away – and property taxes increase to the nominal value of all these properties, you're going to see a huge number of people who are simply priced out of their homes, and it'll happen very, very quickly. <laughs> That's a very, very good point. Yeah, and there's a lot of people like that. Uh, yeah. It would be a disaster. When I li was living in Berkeley, the first two-bedroom bungalow hit a million dollars. <laughs> and I, I just said, this, this, you know, this is madness. This cannot be sustained. Um, Which means ten thousand dollars a year taxes, you know. So yeah. that you know, and that is a lot of money for most people. That's a thousand dollars a month right there, for almost. You yeah. Know, so yeah. Uh, exactly. One thing I wanted to talk about is the incredible wave of of gloating uh, about Obama's election, and even more so about the decline of white power in America. Matt, I think back a few years ago, you made a, a very amusing 
observation. Uh, after Obama's first election, you, you said that the anti-whites were partying like it was 2042. And, <laughs> and they're partying like it's 2042 again, although I think the date's been pushed back to 2050 because of the bad economy. But they're partying <laughs> like we're already an absolute minority across the country. And I'm going to start compiling some of the most grotesque and horrifying uh, bits of uh, this anti-white gloating, because nothing motivates white people better than being exposed to this level of unhinged hatred directed at them. I really kind of think that these people are overplaying their hands. They need to maybe quiet down a bit and don't scare the frog into jumping out of the pot just yet. <laughs> Well, you, you have to understand the amount of resentment. You have to realize that that's what drives, especially the, the Jewish element of our opposition. They, they're not merely, I, I think a lot of these uh, uh, Latin American immigrants, especially uh, Southeast Asian immigrants, they, they're just really joyriding. Uh, of, of course they're going to vote for a free phone. Why wouldn't they? And what real investment do they have in the stability of, of the uh, of this nation long term. It's not their country. Um, but with with Jews and, and a certain uh, insidious uh, subset of, of the white elites, they really do hate us, and they will overplay their hand, uh, I think, in, in mocking us and, and trying to humiliate us. Uh, and you see this with a lot of these things like, ha-ha, white man, you know, you're your heart is beating uh, tick tock and then you'll be dead and you know all of your all of your evil and villainy will be you know over and that's I, I agree with you that that has a very visceral impact uh, that, that sort of uh, humiliation and, and, and social the, the social dynamic there of, of them using their power over us to humiliate us you know they're, they're not just you know, taking seats at our table, they, they plan to take over the table and to flip the table over on top of us. You know, we're, we're, we're looking at the social death of, of the white male in America today, and it's, it's an ugly sight. And, Kevin, you pointed out that white men are still very well armed and really quite angry, and like poking at a dog too long, he's, he might bite back. <laughs> I sincerely hope so, uh, but... Uh... I don't know. I, I, that's, why, that's why I sort of phrase myself sort of really intensely there. I, I want to wake people up, but uh, Matt is absolutely right. I think there's a huge amount of hatred in this uh, society against white people about, on the part of uh, certainly Jews, uh, first and foremost. I, I, I write about Jews all the time, and I, I see it. I see so much of that. Um, that there's just, just recently this rabbi in Israel was talking about how wonderful it was that, that, that Europe was being taken over by the Muslim because it meant the end of Christian civilization and that just, you know, that because Christianity persecuted the Jews. I mean, and that's an absolutely mainstream view among Jews in America that Christian, that the Christian white West is the source of all evil and, and, uh, they're, they're celebrating today like, like no tomorrow. They, they're just very, very happy about this. But I think it also extends to to the black, the African Americans. I think it it does extend to some extent to these, especially these young these young Mexican activist types. I have a big chip on their shoulder. But I agree, not not so much Asians. I wouldn't say, but uh, I think all these groups are sort of uh, they've been sort of encouraged to, to have hostility and hatred against the white majority. I I, I think that's uh, just expect you know it's it's not. It's not enjoined in any way. It's it's encouraged, and uh, so aggression against white people and and being happy at the demise of white people is very very mainstream now. Independently of of what most of our audience is familiar with, you've written about the overseas Chinese, and you 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 touched on how Asians voted uh, for Obama at higher rates than even uh, Jews. I was, I was surprised at that. Yeah, and, and Latin Americans or, or what mestizos. I'm definitely I think that topic needs to be explored more as far as this uh, whether it's whether they're part of sort of a technocratic elite whether you know what because there's going there are going That's to be sure. more uh, East Asian immigrants surely in, in the future I feel like we're we're going to have an explosion of that and I, I think we need to be ahead to, yeah. you know to to know what we're going to be dealing with their psychology I, I do think that that's a very good uh, point that we have to really understand where they're coming from. 
Ricardo Duchesne, who's a Canadian sociologist, I had an article uh, recently that um, was sort of abstracted on our site, and he, he talks about this Asian activist up in Canada who's really hostile towards whites, and, and uh, he's a university professor up there, and he's just stoking the coals and just just hatred towards whites. But I don't think that's real typical. Uh, but um, it, it's certainly the case that they are they're voting Democrat. I do think I, I, I think there may be a sort of implicit sense of of uh, racial identity there that uh, that there's this non-white coalition that's coalescing in the Democratic Party and they're going to be part of it. I'm not sure of that. But I think that's what's going on. Well, I do think that they are they definitely have an elite profile in, in the United States. Uh, the old line about Jews is that they earn like Episcopalians and vote like Puerto Ricans. Right. And this is exactly the case with Chinese and Japanese. I'd like to know more about the South Asians, the, the Indians and the Pakistanis in America, because they are extremely successful as a group. Do you know what their voting patterns are? Frankly, I don't. I, I don't know. Uh, anecdotally, I think they're they're very similar to East Asian immigrants as far as uh, envisioning themselves as an urban technocratic elite uh, with with a, a sort of uh, tribal dichotomy between them as the future, uh, them and their uh, glorious alliance with uh, Jewish and other immigrant. You know, the, the the myth of like the immigrant creating America. They they take this internal narrative and, and hijack it. You know, mm-hmm. uh, a typical uh, East Asian immigrant will actually tell somebody like myself, uh, I don't even know how long my ancestors have been here because it winds so far back in Appalachia uh, that, <laughs> that you lose track. Um, you know, they they think this country is more theirs than mine because they've been told on the way in, and you can't entirely blame them because this is what our schools teach. This is what our federal government teaches. This country is by and for uh, immigrants and, yeah. and that you know my job is to step out of the way and, and let them take over their country yeah my impression and this is anecdotal is that hindus particularly because with south asian muslims you've got that islamic chip on their shoulder but with hindus their attitudes towards whites seem to be a lot less hostile than any other non-white group in america that i've experienced i, I remember when i was living in berkeley I got to know this uh, young Indian fellow who was an undergraduate, and he hung out with whites, and he despised East Asians. And he articulated it this way. He said, I want to have a life, and I can't compete with these Asians who don't have a life. You know, they study their, through the whole weekend. And so he found that the ethnic competition with them was really very difficult. He felt much more kinship with the way of life of the white students there. It is interesting. I was looking at a list of Bay Area billionaires. There are a significant number of South Asian Indian Hindu billionaires in America, and these people didn't even exist in the United States until, I believe, until the, the 60s or 70s. So it's astonishing how quickly some of these people have risen to extreme wealth and power within, you know, a, a few decades of, of coming to this country. Very true. I, I was thinking it would be possible to figure out uh, in the area around Detroit, there's a huge number of Muslims. I, I suspect that they're voting Democrat, um, but I'm not sure. I, uh, it's my impression from sort of reading that. I, I, I'm on one of their email lists, and they, they certainly seem totally involved in the multicultural uh, uh, stuff, and I, I suspect, strongly suspect that they're democratic. Well, you know, you can't really blame them because that is the path to power. They can play that identity politics card, yeah. and they actually get real power out of it. And then the ones who are sort of marginal will try and be the token Muslims or in the Republican Party or whatever. But the ones who really are ambitious, I think they see that that is the route to power in America. If you're not white, it's to be a a radical, principled advocate for your people's interests against the interests of the white majority. That gets you rewarded. Well, I I think with uh, East Asians, uh, Chinese especially, uh, many of them who come over here are apolitical uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, they, They just want to fall in line with whatever the regime is. And if you're in one of America's cities, especially one of its 
technocratic elite hubs, uh, the the regime, the, the party you must belong to, as surely as you would be uh, a member of the Communist Party in China, would, would be the Democratic Party. Oh, yeah, most definitely. Now, that's clearly the case in California. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'd like to shift gears a little bit back to the topic of secession. If the United States breaks apart, what are the fault lines that you think, both Kevin and Matt, what are the fault lines that you think the United States would break uh, apart along? Would it be racial? Would it be regional, cultural, religious? Or would it just be along the lines of the states that currently exist? Hmm. Well, I should think it would be, uh, I, I should hope it would be racial. Uh, uh, if it's just regional, it's not going to solve anybody's problem. Um, and uh, my, my hope, you know, I, I just thinking about this, uh, it would be that, I think that the 2016 election may be even more pivotal because I think Republicans are going to have this belief that they can sort of tinker with things, maybe get the right candidate and all that. Uh, and then 2016 is going to come. And I think they will also that they will if they don't win again. And, and I don't think they will. Then people are going to really have to say it's not a matter of tinkering anymore. You know, we have to really uh, do something. And uh, my, my hope would be that it wouldn't be a sort of a fringe element that, that is that broaches succession, but you know, state legislatures and governors start to really think in those terms. Uh, that uh, it, it's just something that uh, would be far more mainstream than than it is now, simply because there's they really don't see any alternative. And the federal government doesn't do anything for them anymore. Uh, they see themselves being overrun eventually by the same multicultural forces, and and they it starts to be a a sort of mainstream movement. Uh, that 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 would be my hope, uh, and I hope, and I, uh, you know, it wouldn't have to be explicitly racial, but if you, you know, if you, uh, basically restricted to red state America, it would in effect be that way, and then they could, they could restrict immigration and keep it that way. It would be, or they, uh, you know, they they cut uh, social safety net programs and things like that that would right. cause a lot of so people no, to uh, to flee to. Uh, places like California where uh, things are going to be liberal until the lights go out, basically. Um, <laughs> exactly. As far as how we would uh, split up, uh, how how that would come about, how a secession would happen, uh, I, I think we're, we're all just sort of sitting and waiting for the austerity and, and the currency crises to come around before we have the kind of pressure necessary for any of these radical ideas to either take off or be relevant. I, I think we're very much in a planning stage right now where we really aren't in a position to act or do anything. What we need to be doing is planning and preparing. But uh, it, it's all speculative as far as how it will play out. But my own my own thought, you know, I I don't think as far as like the regional differences between white Americans. I, I know. Um, uh, a lot of our audience out there, they, they cherish their uh, specific uh, European ancestries or they cherish their specific region. I, I think especially with the younger uh, generation of whites, I don't think there's that much difference between somebody from Alabama or, or even New Hampshire uh, in a lot of ways. And, and I, I sort of think that the uh, American spirit, because we were flooded with, with so many religious zealots, uh, and so many uh, entrepreneurs uh, and hustlers that you're, you're going to have a sort of different kind of ethnogenesis uh, than, than the country sort of in a moderate uh, way that with the Republican Party evolving into the white party. I, I see more like a, a, a cascade of a bunch of cults, sort of a national anarchistic explosion uh, of these little groups all over America, sort of like the Great Revival. Uh, you, you have in, in the American historical experience these episodes where the whole country just sort of breaks out in, in what during sober times would be considered sort of a crazy collection of all these cults. Just a, you know, a few miles from where I grew up, there was uh, the New Harmony uh, compound where you know, they didn't, they didn't – uh, they, they all remain chaste. Of course, that only lasted one generation, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't, you know, when you don't reproduce, you can go away. But I, I see it more like that, uh, looking at how the Mormon church uh, was founded. And you really do have a, a completely uh, synthetic, rapidly developed 
a, a relatively complete separate ethnic identity exploding uh, from seemingly nowhere in a very short span of time, and that gives me a lot of hope. Yeah, I, I'm hopeful too. I'm glad that it's getting out there that white America is sort of under siege, and I I do think that what I would like to do is have the ideas like secession sort of be in the background. That's why I think it's important for us to just keep mentioning it. And that, uh, you know, when, when white people really don't see any light at the end of the tunnel, they're going to have to do something. And I, I do think that we will have leadership. And I, I'm hoping it comes from the mainstream politicians uh, in, in, you know, places like Missouri, North Dakota, or Idaho. And then they start to say, you know, this country is not working anymore for us. And and uh, really start to think in those terms. And, you know, it could be bloodless. It, it wouldn't have to be a, you know, a military thing. Of course, it'd be enormously resisted. I don't know if it was a coincidence. I was watching Fox uh, Fox News, and there was a commercial about just how wonderful diversity was. And I just had to feel, well, is that is that a reaction to the campaign? Are we trying to do propaganda for diversity now, that we have to buck it up a little bit, you know, and, uh, so they show all these uh, people in a, you know, like six and they show, um, you know, all these different kinds of immigrants and how wonderful that is, you know. So maybe we'll get a lot of propaganda, even more than we usually get. Oh, joy. Uh, oh, joy. Yeah. One of the things uh, that, that I do think should be kept in mind about uh, secession and partition is that there are examples of this that have been quite amicable and peaceful in history. The splitting off of Norway from Sweden a little more than a hundred years ago, was a completely bloodless and cordial parting of the ways. And more recently, the splitting of the, the Czechs and the Slovaks was a fairly amicable divorce. It is possible. One of the things I think make it a lot easier, though, is if the blue sections of the country would in- initiate secession as well. I remember when I was living in Berkeley in 2004, there were a lot of long faces after George W. Bush got reelected. And yeah. I remember all this blue state secessionist talk, and I thought, yes, secede, <laughs> please, please, please secede from the, from the Union, because you know these people would take their toys and harumphingly go off and have their little utopia until it uh, collapses. But if the same thing were proposed by a red state, they would suddenly start thinking, no, these people don't have their hearts in the right place. These people might oh, want yeah. to abuse minorities or something like that. Oh, so yeah, it would be company yeah. with this incredible rhetoric of how racist and horrible these people are. Exactly right. Exactly. Well, that, that's the paradox of being a white male is everybody hates us. Uh, everybody, uh, we're not welcome, <laughs> exactly. but the minute we try to walk out the door, oh, then, you know, oh, you, yeah, if you yeah. try to leave us, then you're a really bad guy. <laughs> it's like, you know, what are you, you know. You know, oh, I'm that bad, I'll leave you guys alone. <laughs> yeah. No, no, they don't want us to leave. That's, that's the, then isn't that interest? Isn't that interest how is they took their hands there? There is a reaction to the various secession petitions that are going around. Somebody's floated the idea that if you sign a secession petition, you should be stripped of your uh, citizenship and sent uh, into exile. Oh, my God. And, and I just think, wow, that's that's really something. Take that, you ungrateful peasants. Uh, it's the, the 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 arrogance of these people. Yet, of course, if liberals initiated it, it would be just fine. Why? Because, well, they're better people. Their hearts are in the right place. No one could ever question their motives, and so they would just uh, do it. So I, I would like to see secession coming from both sides. I think if it came from both sides, then there would be a real chance that it could actually work. The problem is that the, that the blue state America feels that they're in the driver's seat. So, you know, they, they don't want to, I don't think they're going to want to uh, engage in that divorce, uh, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Although, you know, they, they do tend to have glass jaws, too. And if if they find that they just can't get their programs through for whatever reason, then they, they might start thinking in those terms. Uh, Kevin, uh, Matt, what do you think the prospects are for a gridlocked second Obama administration? Uh, or do you think that Republican resistance to Obama's agenda is just going to completely collapse? Hmm. Uh, well, uh, my position on Obama is, uh, you know, I, I think he, he's not the liberal he's made out to be. He's he's a pro-black man in his biography and everything he's done. Now, 
due to the nature of coalition politics, he has to be feminist, he has to be pro-gay, he has to be all these things. But if you look at what he's actually co-sponsored, what he's actually tried to push through, uh, the agenda is always poor black families. And uh, yeah, I've read uh, Steve Saylor's Half-Blood Prince. I highly recommend that, uh, as well as his uh, autobiographies. And the the overarching theme is that this is a man, and I, I admire it to some extent, uh, you know, in, in sort of a, an inverted way. I admire how Obama really uh, lives for his people. And, and I, I think there, there's going to be some somewhat of a parallax between what the Democratic leadership think uh, Obama is going to spearhead and what he actually will spearhead. It sounds like he is going to go for immigration amnesty, though. And that that's going to be very contentious. The House of Representatives is still Republican. And it'll be interesting because if the, the, the Republicans may go along with it, you know, on this whole theory that this this is the magic ticket to appeal to to uh, Latinos. Uh, that that is, uh, I think is going to be very interesting to see what happens there. Well, I'm I'm going to walk out on a very narrow limb here and say I don't think uh, Obama's not done any more with immigration than coalition politics have forced him to. The fact that he waited until right before the election to uh, spearhead that sort of limp-wristed, half-hearted uh, Dream Act amnesty is, I think, to me, an indication that that's not where Obama's going to invest his political capital. If anything, it seems like the Republicans are, are more eager for amnesty and, and pandering to Hispanics than than the Democratic leadership is. It's interesting. You, Maybe, that's perhaps true. I, I'm not sure, but I, I, they, he already has mentioned in the post-election thing. That was one of the first things he mentioned. Right. Do you think it would be better for white interests if – Obama basically got a blank check in his second administration, or if the Republicans grew a pair and got a backbone, perhaps hearing from their constituents that, no, we do not want you supporting amnesty, and therefore there would be a lot of, you know, there would be the equivalent of the Tea Party, again, in the second administration, you know, a lot of resistance to his agenda. Who knows, maybe in the next midterm elections, there might be more Republicans showing up. My feeling is, my desire, personally, is that there be gridlock. I think that that's what the public prefers. They tend to create divided governments anyway. I think that gridlock and increasing tension would probably be better for us than if there's just democratic triumphalism and, you know, whites are just rolled over or, or Republicans are just rolled over. But what do you think? I, I, yeah, I like that. Um, I haven't really thought about it that much, but I, I do think that uh, if, if we were just rolled over, it, it, uh, it might, uh, you know, uh, help white consciousness uh, in the long run. Uh, I mean, one of the arguments why why it would be good for Romney to lose was simply that, uh, you know, you wanted this, you didn't want this feeling that the Republicans were going to sort of save the country because they right. weren't going to save the country. Right. Uh, and um, that so that, you know, you might as well let it play out and, and get, get white people to really understand that, that this is this is the end if they don't do something uh um, I, I think that Obama is not only pro, pro black. I think he's anti white. I, I think he really would like to do whatever he can to uh, make whites a minority, to make to have less uh, as, as little power as possible. And uh, if, if he got re- what he really wanted, boy, that would really be something. What do you think, Matt? Do you think uh, we would be better served by feisty Republicans or Republicans that just roll over and play dead in Congress? Um, I, I am really partial to the Republican Party. Uh, there, there's a meme floating around among the Republican leadership and on Fox News and, and among the uh, sort of uh, Republican conservative elite that the only way to really reach out to Hispanic and black voters is to uh, overtly distance themselves from the from the racist, nativist, uh, retrograde. Uh, elements uh, that are polluting the Republican Party, um, and, and you know, to be honest, there's a point there. You're, you're not going to you're not going to get uh, Latin American votes as long as they're still uh, welcoming these people who want to secure the border in the party. 
Uh, so I, I'm kind of hoping that the Republican Party storms uh, in the uh, in the leftist direction. You, you talk about the Republicans rolling over. I think the Republicans are going to be the one rolling this stuff over. Rand Paul, the su- supposed salvation of the GOP, uh, the 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 now leader of the Ron Paul revolution, uh, came out today in favor of amnesty. You, you have all these Republican leaders pushing amnesty uh, and distancing themselves from the, the white working class base. And, and I want to see more of that. I, I guess I, I don't want to see the Republicans rolled over. I want to see the Republicans uh, absolutely turn on their white male base uh, to the point where white males have nowhere to go uh, and feel – increasingly alienated and humiliated. I, I think that's uh, getting that message home is more important than whatever policy happens to be passed one way or another, in my opinion. It, it occurs to me that if one hopes that the calls for secession and the breakup of the United States come from both left and right, then you would want neither left nor right to be satisfied by what's going on in the government and therefore gridlock and a great deal of partisan bickering and tension and rising tensions would be the best thing. If you really put more hope in whites simply being driven out of the Republican Party and driven to take radical measures on their own, then I think that definitely it's best that the Republicans go full retard and (laughs) – and and that seems to be what uh, Charles Krauthammer and all these other people are are pushing. I, I'm of two minds about that. I, I think probably it would be best for them to go full retard because that's what they're going to do anyway. And we just need to be positioned over the next few years to pick up all those Republican voters uh, who are being driven away and create a sense of a new kind of politics and a new destiny for white America. Kevin, one of the things that Matt Parrott and Robert Stark and I talked about in our post-election roundtable is the importance of recognizing that Romney lost not just because of race voting patterns or racial voting patterns. He lost primarily because a lot of white working class unionized people in the upper Midwest in the Rust Belt and places like Ohio simply could not be motivated to vote either for Barack Obama, who hates them because he thinks they're a bunch of Archie Bunkers, or vote for Mitt Romney, who is a vulture capitalist who thinks that they're overpaid and should be replaced with grateful peasants. And so, you know, (laughs) it's the working class unionized white people in the Rust Belt who are, are really disaffected. And if white nationalism is going to have a political future in America, we need to junk globalist free trade ideology and embrace a kind of populism, including protectionism. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, Yeah. Actually, there's an article right now on on Oxford Observer by Hadding Scott that takes exactly that position, that Romney uh, lost at least partly because he did not appeal much to the white working class uh, outside the South. The South, uh, the, in the South, the white working class was very much uh, in favor of Romney. But outside that, it was like 50-50 or, or so. It wasn't really uh, dramatic uh, one way or the other. And, uh, you know, Romney really needed to, to carry that. Uh, he, so Romney could have uh, appealed to more to more white people, for sure. Um, in which case, it would have been, you know, 65, 70% of white votes uh going Republican, which would have really stunned people, I think. But I think yeah. I think that is a, an issue. I mean, uh, that, that, that uh, the people who run the Republican Party, there's still this plutocratic element, as as uh, Hattie Scott has it. Uh, and, yeah, they're, they're not in touch. Uh, this has been going on for, for years where, where uh, you know, the, the social conservatives and stuff uh, vote Republican, but they don't get anything out of it. They, 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 they don't get anything economically. They don't get the, the social programs that they want. Uh, it's uh, they they're basically taken for granted, and I you know, I suspect even if the Republican elites you know manage to you know go for amnesty and, and do all the liberal stuff, there are going to be some populist candidates come 2016, and and those people are going to get a lot of support from the Republican base. I don't see the Republicans can think they can possibly win without these people. 
you know, they, they can't. Uh, so they're going to have to appeal. That That's their sort of dilemma to try to get the, those people to vote for them, even though they really are not, not doing anything for them. And, uh, you know, they're, it, it's that, that's, that's part of their dilemma, I think. Well, if there's one thing the Republicans, Republicans are good at is swindling white people out of their votes and then not representing their interests. Once Absolutely. They are absolute masters of that. Just talk to the pro-life movement, talk to social conservatives. Right. They're really, really good at that, but maybe they're running out of that old black magic and they just can't turn that trick anymore. I don't know. But uh, exactly, they, they are going to have to co-opt populism if they're going to get elected at all in the future. And I think but that you're that right. Really that plays, is, yeah. This is an opening for a third party or... or uh, they're, they're for a populist candidate to really come in and and, and score some points uh, and, and you know really get on the map uh, in, in the 2016 primaries to really uh, put the, you know I'm, you know again I'm hopeful that I'm involved with the American third position that maybe it's a third party when when white people just completely give up on the Republican Party uh, you know when they just become completely liberal they go for amnesty they uh, do you know everything else to appease the Democrats. That they're going to give up, and they're, and they're really going to uh, you know, defect and, and not vote, and, and or else try to at least get a populist guy to represent their interests, uh, who probably get killed in the general election. But at least you know they feel that they you know are running on their interests. Well, you know, a third party or a populist rogue candidates, they might not win, but there is one thing they can definitely do, and that is consign the Republicans to oblivion. Because right. uh, if there is a, a close race, uh, I mean, a lot of these close races are, are decided by a few thousand votes, not even one percent of the votes. And if you have a plausible populist candidate who uh, gets in there, he might not ever be able to win, but that they can definitely make sure that the Republicans never win. And if the Republicans ever want to come back from oblivion, they're going to have to start stealing populist ideas. Personally, I don't want them to come back from oblivion. But what will happen is I think populist notions and I think and let's hope it's racial populist notions will start getting into the political mainstream because uh, otherwise there's really not too much to expect from America as it is. But, you know, my hope is, is that if for some reason there is a collapse at the center, that the Fed's default on their uh, responsibilities, on their obligations, that sovereignty will devolve down to the next level of jurisdiction, which would be states. And that would cut the problem up uh, into 50 different countries with a lot of a lot of them massively white and that might have the will to craft uh, immigration policies and social welfare policies and things like that that would keep them that way and even enhance their uh, ethnic homogeneity. And that would certainly make the problem a lot easier to break it up into 50 or 60 different sovereign entities. Uh, because one of the things that's very clear is that Jewish power in America depends on centralization. There are just not enough Jews to control 60 different sovereign entities in North America because, uh, well, they do need, they're, they're not that many of them and they're concentrated in urban elite centers where they have the levers of power. If those levers of power don't move the whole nation anymore, I think Jewish power in, in North America is going to be significantly reduced. Uh, that's a great uh, scenario, actually. Uh, and uh, I mean, there's, uh, there's an awful lot of people who do think we are headed to a financial crisis, that the federal government just simply can't keep printing money like this. And then so sooner or later, people are not going to buy treasuries and, and there's going to be some kind of collapse. Uh, that, that's interesting, you know, the fact that the that states might take over. And you're absolutely right. The Jewish political uh, activity in this country has always been directed at the, at the central, at the you know, sort of centralized, powerful federal government, because there's no way they can control Iowa and Nebraska and Kansas and North Dakota and all those states with a very few Jews. So, they, yeah, this is absolutely right. Their political power would be somewhat affected or definitely affected. Their media power, I don't think, would be that affected, really, because, you know, people would be still you know, watching the same movies and things like that. But just in terms of the mechanisms of political control, I think it would really be a setback for them. Well, if the, state, if the states really started to, to, you know, enter into a power vacuum, I think the 
the big national media would uh, sort of lose a, a lot of its power and relevance. I think people would be much more focused on on their their state, and and uh, it, it would be uh, that would be a wonderful outcome, actually. Kevin, uh, Gregory Hood's recent piece, his white nationalist memo to white male Republicans, has really gone viral. It's being reposted all over the Internet. It's being reposted on Craigslist in various (laughs) localities. And it was also mentioned in the same foreign policy journal piece. Have you had a chance to look at that? Do you have any thoughts on it? I'm real sorry. I, I I heard about it, but I am. I yeah. I've been so busy. I just haven't looked at it. Matt, I know you've seen it. Yeah, I, I think it was a, a, an excellent piece that that really uh, uh, imperfectly timed. Uh, and Gregory Hood's such a such an excellent polemicist, and, and he he took these uh, Republicans in, in their greatest moment of weakness, their hour of darkness, uh, and, and said, you know, okay, here's the score. And that's sort of in a microcosm what we're looking at in the big picture here is I don't think we're going to reach people when they're comfortable. I don't think we're going to reach people with sort of, hey, uh, have you heard about these demographic changes? Uh, we're going to have to find these uh, uh, shocks and problems as the system falls apart and as the system turns on them. And each time that happens, uh, not necessarily a taunting oh, way, okay. but in a firm way, saying, hey, are you ready yet? Are you ready to give up on this system yet? Are you ready to uh, explore some of these radicals idea, radical ideas yet? And, and he lays that out very well. And I actually have a, a, a question for uh, Kevin McDonald, uh, uh, if he'd put on his professor hat for a moment. As a, as a psychologist, what are the prospects, in your, in your uh, professional opinion, uh, of these Cold War conservatives uh, uh, around your age and maybe younger, people whose uh, worldview was developed before the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, and who are uh, sort of advanced in age, I don't necessarily want to say old, uh, what is, no matter uh, what the actual political situation is, what is their plasticity as far as ever being able to break out of like uh, their sort of Holocaustianity and Christian Zionism and uh, the the sort of the the sort of mental model of of failed conservatism that they have is it even possible or are we just going to have to wait until they until they go away and then younger uh, radical traditionalist types uh, can can take the torch? Well, I think that's a very good question. Uh, one of the things that that's just bugged me at no end is the maladaptive ideologies that so many white people have, like you say, Christian Zionism, the evangelical movement, uh, libertarianism is another great example where these people just really think that that makes them uh, morally superior and intellectually honest and all that. Uh, yeah, it, it's hard to change uh, these people, and that's why I think it's good, like with, with what Gregory Hood has done, uh, uh, what I'm trying to do, and I'm sure all you are trying to do, you're trying to sort of, you know, really sort of turn up the volume right now, make people aware, you know, and sort of make them stare it in the face that uh, they're they are entering into the dustbin of history unless they do something fast and and really become intensely involved here. They can't just let this thing go because it's going to simply get worse and then we have to start screaming. But yeah, people people don't change their attitudes very well. But it, it has been established that they, if they are going to change, these crisis points is, is when it's going to happen. Uh, crises are always good for that, and I think that, I guess that was my intuition when I started screaming about secession. In other words, I, I, I'm thinking that this is a you, you want to make this into a crisis. You want to make people feel a sense of urgency, and uh, you know, sort of shake them by the, you know, pull them by the by the shirt and, you know, yell at them right in their face, you know, how, how urgent this is. That's how, but crisis points is when you can change people's point of view, you know, where you just got to you know, yell at these you know, libertarians that they're just completely irrelevant, that they're, they're, their their policies are going to just speed things up, if anything, and the Christian Zionists, you know, it, it, they just, no clue. So yeah, I think that that is the that, that's the great usefulness of a of a crisis. We have to make this into a crisis that people don't uh, even more than the media is uh, way more than the media is trying to is going to uh, do for us. 
are you optimistic about our people's prospects over the next 10 to 15 years? Well, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I, again, I think the 2016 election may be more of a watershed even than this, because uh, at that point, the white people are going to say, yeah, it's really not possible. I think now people are saying, well, if we tinker a little bit here and there and do this and that, we can uh, if we get a little better candidate or something like that. Uh, but, you know, it's, at some point, and I hope sooner than later, and that's why I hope, you know, in a way I, I do hope things come to the head. I hope they give them amnesty. I hope they do all this stuff, you know, and make it come to a head sooner rather than later. You know, and it, it's so easy for white people to be complacent, to think that uh, things are basically good. They got their TV sets and they got enough money and, and an SUV and stuff like that, and, and they're not really, you know, pushed to the wall. But we we have to, you know, uh make everyone aware that this is a crisis situation. And uh, the sooner that happens, the sooner white people look in the mirror and realize that, you know, then maybe and hopefully I, I think they will. I mean, I think we're, we're, we're tough people and we, we will find leaders out there. And I think what we need, though, is to really people to understand, that it's sort of like an alcoholic, you know, when you really understand that you've hit bottom and, and you have to do something. That's great. We're hoping for that moment of clarity is going to be dawning exactly. on Fox yeah. News, Republicans. Matt, what do you think? My prediction for the next 10 or 15 years is that uh, our, our federal government is going to enjoy sort of an Indian summer um, uh, of uh, renewed uh, vitality relative to the rest of the world because I think – the Eurozone is going to grapple with these crises before us, I think, because it's uh, less centralized and it has a, a variety of reasons. I, I think the Eurozone is going to experience the crisis first, not because it's going to be worse, but because they're, they're less capable of denying and ignoring it and putting it off. So I think there, we're going to be looking forward to a period where things are more normal in America and our system looks like it's working while the world's falling or uh, falling apart around us, but after that, I think it's going to hit uh, America harder than anywhere else. Uh, you know, for for a variety of those reasons. Once once the federal government's uh, loss of ability, uh, you know, on a, on a very Pavlovian level, the hand that feeds is for a large group of people, for perhaps the majority of people, it is the ultimate factor. You're not going to have uh, white women reevaluate feminism and, and multiculturalism and being part of the democratic establishment as long as this federal government is replacing the traditional role of the father and the church in, in these things. You're, you're not going to be able to really move any significant portion of the public away from the federal government as long as the hand is still feeding it. As long, you know, uh, austerity is coming to America. But until it comes, I think we're really in a planning and preparing stage. Now, after that, I, I, I differ from a lot of white nationalists in that I, I, I don't see most white people in America as sharing a future with me. I, I think uh, a frightening percentage of, of white Americans have uh, a Hispanic nephew, have a black best friend. Have uh, an Asian girlfriend. Have, you know, have all these uh, attachments and entanglements uh, with what I call cosmic America. And, and I believe you, you will have at least half, if not in any sort of racial divide, at least half of finger quote white America will choose to be in sort of cosmic America, sort of a uh, an, an Anglo English speaking Latin American country where they're sort of the overlords over uh, this multicultural uh, dystopia. And we uh, need to start figuring out what those of us who don't want to participate in that, where we're going to go. Yeah, that's a very interesting outlook. My own thinking on this is that I'm optimistic, but I think I'm constitutionally optimistic. It might <laughs> simply be some kind of hardwired psychological delusion. However, I do take solace in the fact that unsustainable institutions and practices cannot be sustained forever, and I do believe that the present American system is unsustainable because it is in fundamental contradiction with the laws of nature, 
and it will postpone the inevitable as long as possible, but eventually it will it'll cease to function. And uh, really, my my greatest fear is that it will cease to function before we have a viable alternative in place. Exactly. Uh, that's the problem, isn't it? I mean, the, the people who are organized now, like the ADL, they're, they're totally infiltrated with all the police departments and everything. The military, uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center is, those people are completely connected into uh, these sources of power that, that would still be there to some extent, at least after the collapse. Uh, right. So we don't have any, any power on the ground. Uh, you know, that's why I'm hoping that, that we can, you know, that the white people are going to understand that they have to do something politically before the collapse. Uh, I would love to see that. And that's why I think that it's important to just keep harping that, look, you're going to be a minority. They, these people hate you. Keep saying it and, and screaming it and hoping. I wish we had a larger megaphone. We have uh, these, these, these little internet sites, uh, uh, but uh, they, they speak to hundreds of millions of people. But you know, we do have a good message, I think, and uh, uh, we'll see. Yeah, I think we have a good message. I think we are learning. I think we're attracting, I mean, you and I both are meeting new people. New writers are showing up with yeah. credentials and accomplishments Absolutely. and big brains. Uh, we know these people are out there because they're coming in out of the cold. And I think that uh, that is one of the main reasons why I'm optimistic is I see the trend is moving in our direction. And also, I stumbled around in a, in a daze of bad ideas for most of my adult life. And I'm meeting 18 and 19 year olds who totally get it, you know, totally get stuff that I didn't get until I was in my 30s. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the Internet had, and, and also multiculturalism in the schools uh, has educated these people much faster than you or I uh, were educated. And so that, that, that too, is a, is a reason to be somewhat optimistic. I think that as our message gets out there and as we bring people into more than just a virtual intellectual online community, but also into a real-world uh, face-to-face uh, network of thinkers and doers, I think that our community will grow. And I think that, you know, in the next 10 to 15 years, we're going to see a tremendous growth in a real world counterculture, racially conscious, racial populist counterculture, political and economic and cultural uh, movement. And I think that that will be there uh, when the U.S. falls apart in whatever way it will fall apart. There will be enough people we will be in a situation where everybody knows a white nationalist. That's right. Once you're in that situation, we're not from Mars anymore, uh, and we can have our ideas actually get accepted. And It's very important that we not be from Mars anymore, and I totally agree with you. I think the most encouraging thing that I've seen is the the bright young people that are coming and, and wanting to write. And these people, a lot of them have very good academic credentials, PhDs, they, they get it. And that's what we need. We need this, this intellectual cadre, this uh, people who are on page. We communicate with each other and we're confident in our ideas. And, you know, we're the ones that when these young white people, when they're looking for, for leadership and, and inspiration, they're going to come to us. They already are. Awful lot of them. Well, Kevin, thank you so much. Matt, thank you so much. This has been a great conversation and I hope we can do this again very soon. Absolutely. I enjoyed it.